Alright, cool. Good Let's time. do this thing. Get her done. 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 done. All right. So. Let's get her. Ooh, nice little transition into there. That was smooth. No, it wasn't. <laughs> that was tar- tar- <laughs> it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. Objective. Unlike this wine, because this oh, wine's yeah. good and I like it. Oh yeah, what are you what are you drinking? I forget. It's a uh, Carlos Ceres. Have you, uh, yeah. uh, have you Carlos spell? Ceres Grand S-E-R-E-S? Reserva 2010? S E R R E S. Carlos S E R Ceres. Ceres. Grand Carlos Reserva 2010. Ceres. Mm-hmm. Is that current release from them? Probably. Um, this is a ground reserva, which means it, it is a minimum of five years post vintage. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it is their. Like, it, it's probably a current release for them. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see what we can because find every, out about every this producer online. <clears throat> every producer is different, you know. You might yeah, hold but it down they're. For, hold it down yeah. for, you know, whatever. Hold it back for fucking, I don't know. The, the required year, the five or ten, or I know yeah. uh, La Rioja Alta, their Grand Reserva, they hold it back for a while. Um, that yeah, one's I was fucking just delicious. Reading about some place that they made there like 1943 and held on to it uh, between the time it spent in oak and the time it spent in bottle. They didn't release it until 1980 something. Whoa. Yeah. Damn. Because you can do that with some of these red grape varietals that go into uh, Rioja wine. Whereas mm-hmm. if you tried to do that with Pinot Noir, you would have Vinagre. <laughs> <laughs> you would. You it would. would be bad. Be terrible. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, you, in theory, you could do it. And people do some funky stuff with, uh, with keeping Pinot in barrel for a long time. And you certainly could. You can hang on to bottles of Pinot that long. But, like, f- functionally, it's like a... You know, it's not it's not a wild bet for bodegas to be like, yeah, we're making this, we're going to release it in twenty years, mm-hmm. and people are like, oh, that's really cool because yeah. they know that when they buy that wine, it's going to be awesome, and right, right, right. they also know that it'll only be like, I mean, because it's Spanish wine, and Spanish wine, like wine generally, is a beautiful little insight into the economy of the world, and uh, Italy and Spain get to make a lot of wine and have to sell it for pretty cheap most of the time because uh, they are. <laughs> <laughs> not doing so hot on the, uh, on the old European economy uh, mm. game. Yep. <laughs> they're kind of the, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the guys saying, hey, at least we ain't Greece. <laughs> I feel like most places so, are saying that. Yeah, yeah man. <laughs> for, for a minute or two. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, it's not great. So yeah, uh, we should we should step back a few a few paces here, and I should uh, uh, give it back over to the point you were trying to make, which is a uh, valuable one about aging and the wines of Rioja. Yeah. So oh yeah, so I'm, so I'm drinking a uh, Marquez de Riscal Rioja Reserva uh-huh. 2014. Nice. Um, nice. And so, yeah, uh, Reserva, I think, so I think, so yeah. Um, oh, and then also I have a different bottle. I don't have Rioja, but I have a bottle uh, of wine from Toro, which is a region in Spain mm-hmm. that also grows. Uh, so they grow uh, Tinto, de, Tinto de Toro, which is a distinct clone of, um, of Tempranillo from that that is grown in Rioja, and it's unique to Toro. So uh, it gives these wines a much more like sort of muscular um like powerful sort of uh, profile to them um so this is a the producer is uh numanthia um and it's uh, so they make a couple wines they may i think they make some really big like numanthia uh, numanthia n-u-m-a-n-t-h-i-a i I think they, they make a couple of wines that are like look how big my dick is wine and i think they're uh-huh. owned by lvmh so the same company that owns like right. Moet hennessy louis vuitton all those oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah but yeah, this is yeah, not yeah, this yeah, is yeah, their yeah. termes t-e-r-m-e-s it's not their regular um i think ter termes uh yeah t-e-r-m-e-s termes is the one that i have and uh 2008 and it's from that wine shop i tell you about that they it's like their last chance shelf i think normally this bottle like retails around i don't know 30 or something but for some reason this like it hasn't sold or something so i ended up getting it for like 
twenty maybe something like that. I forget how much I bought, uh, paid for, but um, yeah. So so that that's a whole separate deal. But yeah, the aging requirements mm. in in Rioja. Uh, I used to know this, but yeah, there's Crianza Reserva and Grand Reserva. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and what is it? Two, three, and five. Like two years for the Crianza, three years for the um, Reserva. For Reserva, and yeah. then five years for the uh, Grand Reserva. And then, yep. what's it like? I forget. It's, like, there's a certain yeah. amount of time in barrel, something, or it's a certain mm-hmm. amount of time in bottle, all that kind of shit. Do you, Do you know that off the top of your head? Well, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. So. Oh, there you go. So, <laughs> yeah, um, Crianza must be in uh, oak barrels and bottles for two calendar years. Um, mm-hmm. Minimum time in barrel for one year. Uh, Reserva is a minimum of three years for both. Minimum time in oak for one year mm-hmm. and then Grand Reserva minimum of two years in oak and three years in bottle but oh, okay. you can you know you can go so and and that kind of ends up being um, yeah then it becomes like gradations and specific producers wanting to you know do different look how big my dick is maneuvers so right, like, right. yeah well we, we <clears throat> just have you know Fifty thousand barrels, so yeah, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna hang on to some shit for a while. Yeah. And that's like it's not even an exaggeration for some of those bodegas. It's like they have tens of thousands of barrels that are you right. know, in these big halls that you know it's like yeah, yeah we just we just built this place, filled it with barrels, and we just hang on to the wine because uh, it's better when we do. So we do better when we do. But uh, yeah, so so depending on how long, uh, whether you know Crianza Reserva, Grand Reserva, there's a bunch of different things that go into that. So different quality <laughs> fruit; those are like ascending, you know, tiers of quality, so to speak, depending on whatever you know. I mean, so it's it's aging, but not necessarily quality, because a certain amount comes down to taste. Like I think I, yeah. I mean, I, I've never really come across a Crianza that's better than like a Reserva. Or better than a Grand Reserva, but I've come across plenty of Reservas that I've liked a lot more than Grand Reservas. Um, because yeah. Grand Reservas tend to... I mean, to, to be fair, maybe... Um, oh, there's a big shift in tannic structure when you go from one year to... Or from two, uh, one year to two year in Oak, which yeah. is a, you know, an option there. Absolutely. But I mean, um, in terms of like barrel presence, so whatever, it's sitting in barrel for a couple more years. Um, mm-hmm. I've had a bunch of Grand Reservas where it's just like all you can taste is the Oak. And um, I don't know if that's just because the way the wine's made, it's meant to age for a really long time. So maybe I'm having like a like an unfair categorization of or depiction of this sort of wine. Um, and when it's not supposed to be consumed yet, it's supposed to whatever, wait. But that's one thing that I do like that some uh, Spanish producers do, like uh, La Rioja Alta. I don't know if I don't know if mm-hmm. 2010 is the most recent like uh it might be the most like their their current yep. release but yeah so they're just putting their 2010s out so yeah they hold their stuff back for like 10 years which is crazy yeah but yeah. when you buy their wine it's like yeah i think right now it's going for like 65 or something like that yeah. but you think about that you're getting like basically the or yeah like 60 or something but you're getting the best wine that that region like but from that producer from that region essentially with 10 years of bottle age on it and you're yeah. buying it for 60 bucks. Like, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Like, if you wanted to get one of the best wines made in Bordeaux with 10 years of bottle age on it, you, that's, <laughs> no, that's, that's nah, impossible. You, you probably have some, um, <laughs> yeah, you probably have some contacts with some flight logs that you're hoping you got expunged <laughs> from. <laughs> yep. I mean, uh, that's, uh, you know, yep. yeah. gotta love it. But, uh, no, it's one of the, the so one of the major reasons that I'm glad we're doing Rio Hot and like I'm genuinely excited about like talking about it when we inevitably have drunk too much of the wine and descend into an overly philosophical cons- uh, conversation or you know um, mm. set of diatribes uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. about the philosophy of wine or you know the culture surrounding wine. Rioja fits into this really cool place where the wines are affordable yeah and inherently demonstrate something about wine that you um that in relation to like the classic regions often immediately comes with an association of higher price but rioja is is this place that you can consistently get 
bottles with age at affordable prices. And they mm-hmm. won't be, you know, necessarily the best examples of the region. Like the and I don't mean best examples like very, very good examples. They won't be the they won't be the insanely expensive examples yeah. that do exist and are probably very, very good. Like and there's you know, there there are the things we've already talked about where there are like crazy aging projects that people mm-hmm. do and there 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 are people who like make the really special good wine mm-hmm. that, you know, is that we might not see in the states or whatever or what you know whatever else like there are uh it's stuff we should talk about later but at its core um rioja is a very cool place for a whole whole set of factors that are all very complicated but you can get into and you can actually take apart and look at the Mm. material structure of why Mm -hmm. um including the economy of spain historically uh, particularly the economy of the region of Spain, the Rioja yeah. exists in, which I don't know particularly much, but I I know that it's in like so like northwestern Spain, which isn't necessarily like the rich part of Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, Northern. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> vaguely, yeah. But um, the, again, I don't know this particularly, but because it's in this, you know, it's in it's in this dry, arid part of Spain where Tempranillo can grow. So there's like this connection of Spain's economy throughout history generally. And mm-hmm. the nature of that, keeping prices for wine down, more or less, generally. And then the success of the varietal of temper Like, I really am talking out of my ass there, so I might be just mm-hmm. dead wrong, which, you nice. know, that's kind of the point. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys, like, we don't you know go. things, and that's it, making people feel comfortable not knowing things about wine. Mm-hmm. I, I think if there is, like, a driving philosophy for what we're doing right now, it's mm-hmm. probably that. Or maybe just, you know, to suck our own dicks. I don't, I don't give a shit. But, um... Yeah. Uh, but Tempranillo being the driving, like overwhelmingly the most grown varietal and being this insanely cool, like I love Tempranillo, not in like a, it's my favorite wine to drink all the time way, Mm -hmm. but in a way that has to do with how educational i think it is as a varietal but like it is great to drink and i love drinking it but it is just this it is this perfect varietal to explain so many things about like why people talk about aging fine wines because Mm -hmm. tempranillo ages super well and pretty reliably and it has these delicate tannin structures that can be very very layered and very complicated that can be heavily influenced by oak which tends to happen but when you use less oak that can change that whole relationship right. and it has these fruit flavors that change as it ages so they're pretty subdued early on and they come out when the wine is like hitting its stride and then they deteriorate mm-hmm. at a certain point so it demonstrates all of these qualities of wine that you tend to get just one or two components of in other wines mm-hmm. Or you, um, or you, or there's some other driving component that's a big part of it. But like Tempranillo is just Tempranillo. I think is just one of the best varietals to educate people about wine with because it is it demonstrates all of these things and is also affordable from various different regions. That um, yeah. particularly mostly Rioja. Like Rioja is the yeah. probably yeah. region is most associated with, mm-hmm. but. The, you can Spain see examples of it from other places. Yeah. yeah. But you can yeah. see examples of it from other places like Portugal or there are domestic versions of it that mm-hmm. are, I think, quite good. I think Tempranillo is actually one of the old world varietals that new world producers have managed to take and make and do some really cool stuff with. Um, I've had examples from the Willamette Valley, from Washington. I've heard of really good Tempranillos out of Idaho, but I've never gotten a chance to try them because like, mm-hmm. getting wine from Idaho when you're not in Idaho is one of those things that like mm-hmm. if you asked if, if someone was like well, how do you do that like how, if you went into a wine shop and were like oh do you have anything from Idaho you might get the person responding to you with they make wine in Idaho like what right right like, yeah uh, it's just this really cool varietal to learn about wine through mm-hmm. and um I could have just said that but that's not how I how I do things exactly so yeah <laughs> <laughs> no it's cool I think um this is sort of like well, we can get into it, but um, the the method of production sort of mm-hmm. is a bit more transparent, and I think um, where it comes from, also a lot of people say, or not a lot of people, but I've you know I, I've heard the case that terroir with Rioja is not as transparent as it is with a lot of other grapes. Um, 
and I kind of get that, but if you have there's there's certain producers that are much higher elevation and that are lower higher a lower elevation and um, it's this whole whole deal like do side by side and you're like oh okay that's it's much different and you can break it down to soil type or whatever but it also comes down to like pick date and there's a whole bunch of other shit but I think one thing yeah. that is um, sort of the common theme that you know especially if you're doing blind tastings or something uh, easily identifiable is the usage of um, American oak versus uh, French so that'll yeah. sort of give it yep. um, you know, it's more like a more traditional a lot of places now are using um, French oak in addition to it or using neutral or using whatever else but yeah. for, if you have a lot of traditional Riojas they all use um, pretty heavy American oak especially on the reserves and ground reserves mm-hmm. um, and that's sort of a, um, I guess the, I mean, it varies for everybody, obviously, but the, the typical sort of like the tasting or notes or flavors or whatever, or like vanilla and what's going on with your brother? Sorry, I was, <laughs> but it, it's not type okay. something in. I fucking hate you. Nah. But, um, <laughs> sorry, Ashley just sent me a thing about how, uh, she's fucking trying to be the new Joe exotic. And oh, nice. She's just like, yeah, I'm going to find a couple straight men to marry me. Nice. Like, wait Sweet. a second. Is she going to have cats or is she going to have... Oh, she has a cat. And it's the... Yeah. It's just one deal. cat. She's, just she's got... Yeah, just a cat. To marry yeah. her with a single cat. With a cat. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, there's a probably in. meth in there somehow. There's something I know about straight men. It's they, they go crazy <laughs> for... love cats. One cat. Well, I mean, I thought you were going to go with the they go crazy for pussy angle, but you know, whatever. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's Just far leave too, that one far too trite for me. Um, Sorry, that completely derailed things. Just I don't care. American text. oak, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So it, no, but it's it. So, coconut yeah. and uh, dill and uh, fuck, what are some other ones? Those, those are the ones that are pretty like uh, commonly stated versus French oak where it tends to be more. Like people say, baking spices and vanilla, yeah, but I think cinnamon, the, the vanilla. cinnamon. Yeah, I think the, the oh. vanilla is like substantially different on um, American oak versus French. I feel like like oh, French, yeah. like French is more like vanilla bean kind of, and to me, mm-hmm. uh, American oak vanilla just tastes almost like uh, like whipped cream, like like you know, not like ready whip or some disgusting yeah, no, shit. The, but so like whipped cream you make that has vanilla like extract in it or something so it has that creaminess and that that like richness to it yeah um yeah no american american vanilla is like um when you can taste the vanilla was added like when it's a flavoring when you're yeah. eating like a all right uh vanilla 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 coke right mm-hmm. vanilla you know vanilla flavor that is like that where as opposed to what you're saying about vanilla bean like when you have like a really good uh vanilla ice cream where they're like really they they made their own vanilla mm-hmm. extract or I something like that because i've, I've had a like, lot of like american like uh pinots in oregon or wines in, mm-hmm. in virginia and stuff where they they do put french oak on it and i still get that like i use the same thing it's it's the vanilla coke sort of mm-hmm. vanilla flavor so i mean it's uh, still like it's still yeah it's still ha- definitely is like a moving target yeah, for, yeah. like these the, in terms of the things coming out of my mouth being wild generalizations but there is this well, like i um, guess like it's, it's important to note that like it's all relative so you might taste yeah fucking vanilla coke when you have american oak and i'll have vanilla coke when i taste french oak and it doesn't fucking matter because that's yeah. our markers like into person yeah well and i think I, so i've always associated like the um the, I, I think the biggest part of American oak for me, t- personally too, in this whole conversation, mm-hmm. is a um, is a quality of tannins. Oh, okay. And a quality of tannin structure, and basically just a, a, a an authority of tannins, like the mm-hmm. d- the degree to which tannins will affect the wine. Like I like very broadly consider American oak, I think, to be more astringent. Than French oak, um, not bitter, but like mm-hmm. it's a very like delicate, you know, distinction. And yeah. the mm. so, yeah, I I'm trying like, and the problem is like I'm talking about all this, trying to remember. So I had the chance to 
make Tempranillo a few years ago on which American oak was used in addition to French oak. And I wish I could, like, I know I barrel tasted the funk and mm -hmm. wines, but I can't tell you very clearly that I, like, remember those differences precisely because mm -hmm. I only did it a couple times. But, um, General, like speaking, well, and I'm also confusing it because the, another part of that whole uh, thing was Hungarian oak being used mm. on some of the Syrahs in addition to American oak, I think in addition to French oak. So mm. it was, they had a very complicated barrel regimen and it was also like pretty much com contained to a couple Coopers when it came to American and Hungarian oak. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, Generally, I think American oak is valued when it comes to Tempranillo because it serves something like a sponge where like the, mm. the more the more sort of uh, like low resolution tannins that happen in American oak mm -hmm. do a good job of like sopping up mm. some of the more aggressive tannin structure that you get from Tempranillo than like, mm -hmm. you know. Even Syrah, like Syrah is a right. more uh, tannically subtle wine than Tempranillo. Mm -hmm. But yeah. this is, um, you know, but like you were saying, uh, this is one of those conversations that really like everyone's experience with these, th these things is different. And mm -hmm. it is one of those things where, and it's one of the reasons I like Tempranillo because Tempranillo is a varietal that not everyone will like. It is not going to be everyone's cup of tea. I enjoy it. It's not my my go to wine all the time, but it is a varietal that I would throw at all kinds of different di or you know all kinds of different dishes and all kinds of different um, occasions and whatnot. Yeah, and I think it's very educational because it's a good like like you and I right mm -hmm. when talking about wine, we both live in this world where like no look, let's talk about wine. Eventually, you'll like Pinot Noir. We'll find one you like. It's not Pinot Noir. <laughs> right. It's you. You got to learn yeah. to like Pinot Noir. Yeah. Pinot yeah. Noir is good. Mm -hmm. And you are wrong for not liking it. Like, we both live right. in that world. Right. And kind of the same thing with Chardonnay, right? <gasps> oh, yeah. No, yes. I, I feel it. Well, I feel like Chardonnay is, m like, much more accessible because it's... Yeah. Th th there's something for everybody. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. There are going to be Chardonnays that neither of us like, and right. th that we will tell someone that we're like trying to teach about wine. You're wrong for liking this because right. that's what you do to people when you're teaching mm -hmm. them. You tell them yeah. that they're wrong and they're bad right. and they suck and they need to go right. to hell. Right. Right. But, See, um, but I, I choose the more subtle option where people are like, <laughs> "Oh, I like uh, fucking barefoot," and I'm like, "Okie dokie, <laughs> what's your budget?" They're like six bucks a bottle. I'm like, "Cool," and then I like. Show them like here's another six buck bottle where it's like, it's not great, yeah. but it's it's something that I found that's like a great deal or something, and then I'll like, mm -hmm. show them that and they're like, oh wow, this is so much better. It's like okay, good. Yeah. Now you can acknowledge the difference between like watered down fucking Franzia, yeah, and uh, something that somebody actually kind of gave a shit about when they made. So it's yeah. like, all right, how would you feel about like spending nine dollars on this? They're like okay, and then you sort of like. We trick people to like, into liking wine and, and then you know, before you know it, they're buying uh, Clos de Bez. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, they're taking a loan out, you know, getting yeah. a second mortgage. <laughs> it's like, look, I drink salon or nothing, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> um, no, but, so going back to Tempranillo, that's, that's part of why I like Tempranillo so much because there will be people out there who just don't like it and that's fine. Like you can't be mad at someone for being like, no, this is my thing because Tempranillo isn't it isn't the wine that everyone's gonna love but i feel like it i feel like that, it's it's the most like i feel like it's popular it is no i think it is you know? and i think that a lot of people like it yeah so you're not gonna run into all that many people who are like no but it's mm -hmm. a very good wine for when somebody just when they're when they're their line in response to you know like what do you know about wine or like do, do you like wine and they say like oh yeah i like red wine yeah tempranillo yeah. is awesome for that exactly it's like yeah that's exactly what i was gonna say it's like grenache mm -hmm. but broodier and it's got a different sort of thing to it because both grenache yeah. and tempranillo i think what your comment earlier is a good one they're not wines for discussing terroir mm -hmm. they're wines for discussing winemaking and uh, uh grenache age. 
Grenache, I think, could definitely there'd be a case for terroir. Definitely, there terroir. is, there is. Yeah. But I think there are a lot of other considerations. Like Grenache gets blended so much that you need to start having conversations about how, like, the, ter- the terroir of the wine you're talking about will probably also be influenced by the blending options with the. Oh other yeah, well yeah, you would need a hundred percent Grenache wines to do yeah. that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think you could. Yeah. Uh, you're totally right, but because of because of that, they both end up being these varietals that open up all these other conversations. Mm-hmm. So, and that's the pro- that's kind of the problem with trying to jump someone in on Pinot Noir is like, this is good wine. And then you right. immediately fucking trip over your own dick into like, this is why this wine tastes this way because the hill slopes at this angle uh, in this direction oh, and dude, the soil I've, types are like this. Yeah, I've, I've never thought about the fact that Pinot Noir is never in blends. I've never thought about that before. And like, it, it, if, very if, anything, rarely, yeah. if anything is ever blended into it, it's like sacrilegious. Like I know yeah. people are telling me about like Russian, uh, Russian River oh, Valley Pinots, yeah. how they're like, I've oh, no, a... they, they definitely blend in like Syrah into those because they're fucking mm. big and there's no way that like Pinot would ever be that color and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I have, um, I, have a, I have a story that I can't tell you on the podcast because it's yeah. too obvious, but it's right. very funny and I'll, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, actually I've, never, I've told I've you the story, about but, how, but you know, yeah. Pinot is like the, the, I mean, obviously it's like a wine nerd's wine for a lot of reasons. But, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so a, a, yeah. A, a, a separate story is like, I, I know people who have been mm-hmm. accused of putting Syrah in their Pinot. And mm-hmm. it's like a big state, like it is a, mm-hmm. it is a, it is a political statement that you're, you know, yeah, totally. you're setting up a feud saying that's right, a similar. Right. And the person that said it and who they said it to, it was kind of like, no, nah, you, 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 no, that's just, a, they, they make wine from a different site than you do. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of good reasons their Pinot tastes that way. And you know what? There are a lot of producers, I think, in Russian River who are probably not adding Syrah. Yeah. They're just making what they're making because it's like, well, you know, look, it's hot here. And that's what, you know, that's what you get when you right. make Pinot Noir in places kind of hot. Um, mm-hmm. But, but... Like no, it's a, it's an important conversation in terms of blending, and it's a big part of why people don't blend Pinot Noir because yeah. they want to have conversations about terroir. Mm-hmm. Same is true with Chardonnay. People want to talk about terroir. People want to talk about terroir because terroir is how you sell wine. And yeah. again, the, the whole region <laughs> of like France, or sorry, of that's kind uh, of a cynical attitude to have, though. I don't. It's true, I don't but, think so. But but that's, I mean, that's not the only reason. No, like there's people who are like idealists, like you and me, who are like, no, we like <laughs> we need to do this to express the land, and you know all that other bullshit. Yeah, but the, no, no, no. It's like, uh, that, but that's one of the really funny things about it is like terroir is the best marketing strategy wine could have because it's the whole strategy of like vineyard, place, right. time, chateau. Mm-hmm. You know, you sell wine on terroir and vintage, so like the vintage is ephemeral. It's this expression of the literally the sunlight of that season yeah. and the rain of that season, mm-hmm. which disappear except for, you know, what remains in the fruit and right. what part of the fruit you right. can hold on to. It's a very beautiful poetic thing, yeah. coupled with the poetry of that particular place, which has mm-hmm. this emotional connection to these particular people, and they make this particular thing. Right. So there's this whole interlocking poetry of time and place mm-hmm. that go into wine as a concept. Yeah. And terroir is this, you know this uh this 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 way of packaging all of that that people mm-hmm. talk about all the time and it's right. very related to these varietals that we associate with terroir and th- all the varietals we associate with being the most valuable valuable most varietals out of which the best wines are made mm-hmm. those all are wines about which you can talk about terroir that's true yeah always 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 yeah uh like big statements that i will brook no argument over like because I, no like i you know obviously there are exceptions and there should be but but, yeah. but like generally I mean, how much how much yeah. do you think of that is is just because people are it's let's say i don't know with some fucking really big wine like uh like like penfold grange right mm-hmm. let's let's take that wine right it's a it's a um it's a blend yeah so um you're not really getting an expression, you know, it'll be like, I don't know, 15% from this site, 30% from this site, blah, 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 blah. You're not getting a true, you know, it's not all whatever, this fruit from this AOC, this fruit from this AOC, whatever. 
and um, yeah. like individually or this parcel of land from here. So you can't really say you're like, oh yeah, no, this is like really expensive Australian wine. Yeah. But they like, they don't need, I don't even know. I don't talk to like sales reps from Penfolds or whatever, but like um, they, like, I feel like you couldn't make that argument with them. I'm sure they probably do. But how much do you think like people who already have a, like a really good reputation like they do use that just to boost sales and how much do you think it's like a claim or, 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 or what do you think or which part is the claim like i guess how much of it is earned and how much is, is used to just like improve sales because because from if, if i'm determining mm -hmm. what you're saying correctly is that's just sort of like a like a marketing thing people use to sell wine rather well, than so like it, 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 it coming like pe people like if I don't know, some like the wine advocate came or somebody came and tasted like this wine and would be like, do, do you think they would ask first what soil type it was on? Or think they'd be like, oh, is this on limestone soil? Or would they, or would you be the one telling them, oh, it's on limestone soil? And then they write down like, oh, okay, great. It was made on limestone soil and they would like wax poetic about it. Well, so there's a kind of funny um, inversion there, I think of... Uh... Of exactly what I was saying, and I think you're right in that they they, they would um, they would set the terroir stuff secondary. So an interesting like point in the um, in the uh, in the second Psalm movie that I remember mm -hmm. when I bother to think about that movie is that when they talk <laughs> about Penfolds, they talk about Grange when they start talking about Parker scores, uh -huh. because nice. Grange is a hundred point wine, right? Or has been, you know been 100, 100 point vintages a few mm -hmm. and um perfect wine perfect wine it's like literally the, it's the you know that I guy those that two words talking, together like, oh my god yeah so <laughs> so so i so terroir i i i say that thing about it being a marketing thing mm -hmm. a marketing tool it is an endemic marketing tool to wine that cannot be stripped away from wine you can never not enjoy the poetry of terroir when trying to sell wine to somebody that's true it doesn't matter if there's no terroir involved in your wine it doesn't matter if mm -hmm. you get your grapes from miles from where your vineyard is or from, right, right. you know miles from where your winery is you will have the benefit of people having that idea of terroir just in their heads even if they don't know the word terroir and the definition of terroir mm -hmm. that is associated with wine because that's wine true. comes yeah. from a vineyard and a vineyard is a place and a place is particular and it's pretty and Mm -hmm. Much more than a farm. Like people, yeah. it's part of how, you know, how, like small farms work is like they have this pretty little farm where farming happens. But mm -hmm. the nature of farming in terms of growing just vegetables or boring crops is you have a much more boring vista than you do with vineyards. So there's this inherent poetry to, to the, the slopes. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the cool looking vineyards and old... You know, in Spain, Spain. So Spain mm -hmm. is a great place where you can talk about like the elegance of the terroir, the elegance of the 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 space in terms of its visual element, mm -hmm. or like what people see and emotionally yeah. respond to. But then, how much it relates to the wine becomes this big conversation. So, like, you know, we'll we'll have to do an episode where we talk about terroir as its own thing. But as yeah. it relates yeah. to what we're talking about right now, and why I wanted to bring it up with Tempranillo. Terroir is this f funny, fickle thing because, well, and so it, it totally should be something that we, you know, cop to is that terroir isn't something people like outside of the, the, the vague, like claiming it to a place that you can taste a lot of wines from over a long set of vintages to get an idea of what is endemic and special and sets that place apart compared to other wines from nearby, mm -hmm. which you have to do in practice. <laughs> terroir is a very arguable concept because yeah. what exactly makes it is something that not everybody agrees about like right, right. you know you can you can make a claim like chablis terroir is defined by the limestone soils of the area and mm -hmm. you're probably right but you're not completely right because there's all these climactic con conditions that have right, to be considered right. so like mm -hmm. the weather over yeah, the course of everything. the season compared to other yeah. places it's everything and that's the yeah. point is it's everything it's everything but that means and and what's great about it being everything is it means it's the stuff you have no control over mm -hmm. yeah but then 
it's everything. So it's also the things you have control over. So how you farm your vineyard is also important. So there's right. just all this other stuff. And that's what I like about Tempranillo so much is it separates out those two things where people, you know, there are so many things about Tempranillo that feel like they're not terroir driven mm-hmm. because it's it, it's pretty reliably going to occupy certain spaces in terms of like profile and uh, and and weight and tannin and all these things and then all of the choices and the means that the bodega has access to in terms of how they vinify it and then what they do to age it Mm -hmm. start to separate them out and then um in spain it's there are all these laws about what you can and can't do that mean that there are like these hard lines that you know are not going to be crossed but then these other places where people try to separate themselves out so there's uh, like I I think there is some like terroir you know conversation to be had or some conversation about like viticultural practice with uh, Tempranillo for sure, but I like how consistent it is because it because it's temp it's 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 uh, it's terroir variations. Mm-hmm. While you sh- like probably could tell the difference between like a new world Tempranillo and an old world Tempranillo or like a Tempranillo from like if you were really like perceptive probably you could tell the different subregions of Rioja apart. Mm-hmm what you 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 i i don't know if people getting into the kind of conversations around around tempranillo that people do around uh pinot noir because like yeah and we were talking about this earlier today but it's like pointless but people want to be able like i've literally been in a situation where somebody blinded me on burgundy and wanted to know what part of burgundy i thought it was from and then what part of cote de nuit i thought it was from yeah yeah, yeah. And I, because we were doing options, guessed right. And then they asked, well, why do you think it was Von Romany? And I said, ah, hmm. we had, and uh, to be fair to myself in the past, which I don't deserve, um, we'd had a, uh, and my, I'm, I'm about to shoot myself in the foot because I'm, I'm not sure that this is in, uh, we'd had a Montrachet, a Pauline Montrachet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was one of the other options, and it didn't taste like that, precisely. And we'd had this other, like there were there was this minutia about how it was different from these other options that I'd a couple nights before had examples of, and I was like, well, it didn't taste exactly like those, so I'll guess for the one that I don't know, mm-hmm. and I was right. I also was just guessing the one that the two other people who were being asked hadn't guessed; they'd guessed the other things. Right. And like that's you know whoopee for me, I got it right, but I only got it right for like these considerations that didn't have to do with me knowing the wine Mm -hmm. but and this is the point of all this not the fact that i got that right that time years ago and people should know how good i am at Mm -hmm. making out these things because i'm not it was a question that the guy who asked me Mm -hmm. he probably would have gotten right because he knows pinot noir that well he's an insanely smart pinot noir drinker and pinot noir is something you can do that with like and, it, and it's it's this complicated conversation in the wine world and people love citing the like studies that show that only 10 percent of wine professionals can actually tell that they're drinking the same wine right you know in repetitive um you know moments yeah yeah no it's tough if you get blinded on a, a wine and somebody just pours the yeah. same glass side by side to you you're like it, it fucks with your head it fucks with your head. This guy, I like. He's one of the. He is. He is a figure in New World wine making. Mm-hmm. He's an important figure in um, in the the region that he pioneered. Mm-hmm. And I I genuinely believe he can tell the difference between, you know, something that comes from uh, Maconnet and Cote de Nuit easily. And mm-hmm. probably can tell the difference between something that comes from Von Romanet and Montrachet pretty easily. Mm-hmm. I am sure he would have a hard time doing that with Tempranillo. Not, oh, yeah. yeah. Not just because Tempranillo is not his bag, but because that's part of Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. And um, and I, I love that about it because it means that you don't have to like it, it's like uh, it's it's like, when, when you're teaching someone about something you don't like you don't start teaching someone about painting by describing how leonardo da vinci pricked tiny little holes in the paint around the eyes of the mona lisa to create a a misting effect 
Mm-hmm. You don't start by talking about like these things that he did that literally like two other people have ever done in paintings that they actually made mm-hmm. because it is mind bogglingly tricky. You don't start teaching someone how to play the guitar by teaching them how to do a hammer on or a slide. Right. You start by teaching them how to make a pretty fundamental chord. Mm-hmm. And Tempranillo is like a, you know, Tempranillo is, you know, some pretty viable, you know, technique stuff. It teaches you good technique and it's really f- good and, and, it, and it's an expression of people making very, very good wine out of a very, very particular varietal that has these things that can be known about it, which is part of why they can have all those laws surrounding it that are, you know, read a, pretty codified. Because mm-hmm. as far as I know, there aren't the same degree of laws. Like, you can go to prison, apparently, in Spain for adding water to wine. Hmm. Like, adding water to must. Right. That won't happen to you in France, That's as far crazy. as I know. Yeah. Like, there's still laws. There are a lot more laws in both those places than in the U.S., but, you know, mm-hmm. most of our laws have to do with taxation. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very long tangent, but, um, uh, you know, I like hearing my own voice, except when I actually play the episodes back and I have to listen to my own voice because my own voice is weird. <laughs> yeah. But, oh, um, man. Sorry yeah, about that. No, so, it really went off on actually, there. Actually, it's a, it's a pretty good um, transition to talk about terroir because now I can talk about yeah. this Toro. Mm. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I found, I always found, um, Sangiovese hard to, or Sangiovese and Tempranillo both hard to identify during blind tastings, because mm-hmm. to me it wasn't like okay. So for for Cab, right? If I smelled any, if it was a red wine and I smelled bell pepper at all, it's like okay, it's Cab Sauv or it's Cab Franc, and then like I can immediately narrow it down. A mm-hmm. lot of black pepper in it, okay, it's probably Syrah. Like you know, mm-hmm. if is it like do I smell like ban- like banana peel or bubble gum or anything like that? Okay, it's probably it's carbonic maceration is probably like Gamay. You know, yeah. like things like that, you can just sort of pin it down. Yeah, if you me, smell anything mushroomy, it's probably Pinot Noir. Probably Pinot Noir, yeah. yeah. So there's that, or like that really particular kind of cherry, whatever. Yeah. But for me, yeah, it was yeah. it was it was really hard because I didn't have anything in particular to point to um, for Sangiovese or Tempranillo. Sangiovese sometimes mm-hmm. like I would would get that like tea leaf kind of thing that I thought was really mm-hmm. cool. That's yeah. it's, that's unique, but with um, Tempranillo, it's like okay. Well, if I if I can't rely on like the American oak, because a couple of my friends they would give me like Riojas that were made with French oak, and I'd be like, all right, fuck you. You know, they're not going to give me this on the blind taste yeah. camera, but like I still need to know it. French oak is used in the one that I'm drinking. Yeah, on this yeah. The, on the Grand Reserva. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's tough, but I mean, it happens. You need to know, but it was hard for me yeah. to do. But I think it's also because I didn't have a ton of um i hadn't consumed as many crianzas as i should have and i also didn't really mm. have a ton of like um Ribera del dueros with enough like age on them or, or the right ones i guess and then or toros or any other um non rioja um fucking tempranillos because those weren't going to be on the test you know yeah but um when you have one wines that are outside of rio or Ribera del duero or whatever you're like, oh shit, this is really cool. So this Toro is like, yeah. it's it's insane. It's so different. It's like, uh, like I don't even know how to. So when when you go back and forth, the the Toro smells so savory. Like I know we like mm-hmm. always joke on the the whole scorched earth thing. But you can just yep. like, kind of smell how like barren. You can just like yeah. get a picture of how the land looks based on how it smells, and then you go back to the Rio and it smells nice and. You know, sweet and fruity and vanilla and all that kind of stuff. And then you smell the, the Toro again. And it's just like a desert, you know? Yeah. And what vintage like, are, are those two wines? The uh, Rioja Reserve is a 2014 and the right. um, the Toro is a 2008. Oh, cool. That's interesting. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. so the Toro's got a bunch of age on it. I mean, it's still like, yeah. it's still big, you know? Mm-hmm. But it has this really cool... Um, it's got this like this kind of reductive thing where you know mm-hmm. like the if you have a wine it's like super reductive it has that like like the Walter Scott uh, shards they'll have it they have like that nuttiness to it that yeah comes with the reduction yeah, yeah. um so it so if if you take that just that nutty flavor rather than the the pure reduction associated with it it has that combined with the fact that like 
if you take like a piece of good sourdough and you like mm-hmm. uh, toast it pretty hard or like if you take like a like a loaf of sourdough that's been taken out of the oven and the top's gotten pretty dark like that yeah. sort of like caramelized wheat sort of flavor mm-hmm. um that's in there so that really toasty dark but not toasty yeah. in terms of like oh that dark. slight sourness that guinness has yeah 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 which is actually because they, uh, they toast their malt i think hmm. Mm. But yeah, that slight. There's I. Oh yeah. It, yeah, tempranillo. That it's that it's like a, it's like a. Oh, it's so good. It's it's so good, and it's it. I like. Oh, it's delicious, man. It's like the the. It's like that. Uh, I I you're right. It it it's a it's a elusive thing. I, I tempranillo to me has this like. Um, it's like if you leave behind the black pepper in Syrah, take mm-hmm. the fruit element, and just drive it in a little bit more. Like you mm-hmm. turn up the gain on the fruit tones. Yeah. And yeah. lean into that in Syrah. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, get yeah. to where Tempranillo totally. is. Yeah. It's got that, like, I mean, it can have. So it's cool because it's it shows sort of, it can have this sort of indulgent, <laughs> sweet richness mm-hmm. that's very like bordeaux-esque kind of yeah it's like spanish bordeaux essentially yeah or it can have this um it's like cab that's more leathery yeah yeah but it or it can have this no but on the on the, on the tourist side of the spectrum it's this super rustic like yeah you're right like syrah yep. or uh chateau, no not even chateau to pop like like a coat roti like super yeah. like yeah rustic with a whole bunch of age on it and it's just like oh my god yeah, uh, fucking roasted, but not in terms of like. I mean, it has high, high alcohol, but it's not like this fucking Shiraz over here that mm-hmm. we can have at a later date. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But it's. Uh, I mean, it still tastes well made, you know. But it's definitely big. But it's it's fitting. They're not trying to make a wine from a hot climate into like Burgundy because you can't make Burgundy there. They're making. They're embracing what they have and making what yeah. they can make there. No, and it's the thing that I like so much is that Tempranillo to me. Is this wine that lots of people are making with huge elegance, mm. but because yeah. of the nature of what Tempranillo is as a varietal, mm-hmm. that elegance yeah. is literally just unrecognizable mm-hmm. for at minimum five years. Like it's, yeah. why, it's why I'm glad that there are these like laws around how it is code, like what what it is called. And how it's codified and when it's sold, because it forces people to be, you know, to to not drink it until it's like probably, you know, going to be decent. Yeah. But even then, yeah, I think totally. people tend to be drinking it too young. Like the good ones, like I'm sure there are a bunch of Crianzas out there that if they were like given enough time, would be pretty, pretty stellar. Yeah, but certainly no, in totally. terms of the reservas. Um, and I think that you're right that like the g- reservas and ground reservas, like the the nature of like their oak character. Like I think mm-hmm. a lot of ground reservas are pr- they're probably like twenty plus year wines just because it's a lot yeah, of tannin yeah. on them. No, at least yeah. And yeah. you need to give them that time. But if you do, they resolve pretty well. It's one of the reasons that so the the thing that I discovered about that that producer I was telling you about the Anciano, mm-hmm. they're not actually a Rioja. They make okay. a Tempranillo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they are not a Rioja producer, but they make a Tempranillo that they release at five years, when they release at seven years, and when they release at ten years. And those wines aren't, you know, the, they're not the best expression of Tempranillo in the world, but they're good, and I like them because they... So I got... just know this guy who runs a bar uh, in my hometown that has this really amazing Spanish wine list, but he... I think it's those wines... It's either those wines or some other producer who does the same thing with how they hold them back. And he keeps mm-hmm. all three of them on the list at their respective price points. And he, we were asking him about it one night, and he poured all three of them next to each other for us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you take, like, that's the thing that people should do with Tempranillos if they can ever, if you know, if you can go out and, like, your options are spending $50 on a bottle of, like, nice, um, like, on one. If you're someone interested in learning about wine, and you budget fifty dollars for the week, right? You could either get a bottle of like Amarone, which would be spectacular, yeah, 
Or you could buy three bottles of Tempranillo at different mm -hmm. ages and see how their expression changes because you'll probably yeah. be able to find a Crianza, a Rioja, or a Reserva and a Gran Reserva and look at the distinctions between them. And if you're interested in getting three bottles of wine, none of which will be that expensive, and learning something about how a varietal changes with age, Tempranillo is a great insight into that. And you're not going to be able to do that with at you know at a decent cost with Pinot Noir, which is one of the sad things about it. Um, or like, it's a varietal you can do that experiment with if you're interested in doing it. It's hard to do that with lots of other varietals. Like, um, like maybe you could do it with Barbera, but uh, mm -hmm. but you'd have to have a wine shop that yeah. like had stuff from all those vintages. And yeah. Rioja is a place that you will get that from. You will mm -hmm. get. A variety of vintages whereas most um like like most supermarkets are going to have you know a three vintage span at best of mm -hmm. pinot noir and yeah. uh yeah. caps off but even most wine shops like i was telling one of my friends who's not super into wine but i was telling him about it and i was like yeah man i mean you, you can't just go into a wine shop and buy like 10 year old wine nope and he's like what really like i didn't know that i'm like yeah you go into a wine shop almost everything is like current release and this they have something yep. that they can't sell yep. in which case it's old or unless you know unless they're a place that has like a separate refrigerated room or a special area where they have like the or special cave <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 that yeah. they either bought someone's cellar which is unlikely because hardly any places do that anymore or they special ordered something or you know fucking whatever yeah. um but yeah, Which, you, you, but but you Rioja really... is something that you might see that with. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that's why like if if they carry a bottle of Gran Reserva, or Reserva even like this one, just this was a very like sort of this bottle was like sixteen bucks, and it's got yeah. six years of bottle age on it, and it's delicious. Yeah. It's fantastic. Oh yeah, I should I should mention the bottle I picked up was twenty five dollars, which nice buying a ten year old bottle of wine for twenty five bucks. Yeah, kind of. Kind of amazing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, but the same thing. The one that I got, the Termes of Europe, I mean, that was like an exception because it was a, yeah, because it, it was a weird, it's a weird shop, and it's great. I love that place, but you know, you don't find that everywhere. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's totally something that, like, you know, uh, not to completely redact all the stuff I was saying earlier, but I'm sure there are a bunch of people from Spain who would be really fucking pissed if I was saying that terroir is not an element of Tempranillo. I'm, right. What I'm saying is, I don't understand the terroir of Tempranillo. And I hmm. still learn a huge amount from Tempranillo whenever I drink it. Yeah. Like, it's still a valuable learning experience without my focus being on terroir. Partly yeah. because I'm not... I'm, I don't have access to a broad enough range of Tempranillos, and I don't know the the region of Rioja well enough, or just the, terroir, the, 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 the geography of Spain well enough to be really learning anything about terroir if i'm being told what to learn about it yeah as opposed to like even you know the the laws surrounding aocs in france means that i can learn about terroir in burgundy from any yeah even village quality burgundy i drink mm -hmm. and there's something to that about like barbaresco is a tiny region of italy it is minute yeah. and yeah. you can you know, you're you're inherently learning about the terroir of Barbaresco when you drink Barbaresco because it is such a small region that like mm -hmm. you're kind of, you're like that's that's that is the terroir. And then yeah, you know, th there is variation in the different Barbarescos you drink. But like, so I don't know. Temp I I just value so deeply in all of these ways we're talking about it. Tempranillo as this affordable, fascinating way into vintage into tannin into fruit expression into you know like blending and that the effects of that all of these things that can often be so inaccessible yeah in so many varietals right like yeah. you know grenache covers a few of those bases um i think mm -hmm. you can also learn huge things from syrah that you can mm -hmm. also get pretty affordably um, yeah, Syrah is, yeah. Syrah is kind of like I think the next step where like more places are growing Syrah you can learn more about new world versus old world from Syrah yeah, yeah. you can start learning some stuff about terroir mixed with blending decisions that happen in Syrah they're you know yeah. pretty like, you know. 
Yeah. Um, and then all of the stuff about like vinification versus aging versus all that stuff, mm-hmm. that all plays a factor. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. You any of those concepts that you're like, "Ooh, I think I could learn about this through Syrah." It's like you could you could take a pass at it with Tempranillo and it would probably cost you a third the price. Oh, 100%. The overall yeah, expenditure. That's a couple things I was going to say when you're talking about village level burgundy. It's like, "All right, if I wanted to get a village level of Jeffrey Chambertin or a Chambon Moussigny or Von Romane, that's I'm already like one hundred and twenty dollars oh, at least. Village level von Romani is probably it's it's, about it's 80 insane. Bucks. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, or you can. Get, <laughs> it's really good, but <laughs> yeah, but it's like here, perfectly delicious your reserva. Like, you don't need to spend more than twenty dollars. It's crazy, but yeah. like that's just that just goes to show. Like, it it kind of scares me because it's like Spain is this treasure trove of values right now, and it's yeah. like this is what Chateau Neuf du Pop used to be. You used oh, to be able to go and, and, and used to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like any, like I remember, like t- like talking to to older people who were like, "No, yeah, I don't buy, I don't buy wine that's over like twenty five dollars anymore." Because when I was younger, we used to be able to buy like first growth Bordeaux for like thirty five dollars or something like fucking yeah. insane like that. And it's like now, yeah, now that it costs like you add a zero on the end of it, it's outrageous. So it's like I'm not gonna fucking do that. No, the but, the curve um, in wine prices looks a lot like the curve in uh, private college education. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, don't think about that too hard. Just don't, <laughs> don't think about that too hard. The problem is, like, you know, there's at least solidarity in numbers when it comes to student loan debt. But if you go yeah. into debt to learn about wine, oh know, god, I mean, I mean, it only takes like a weekend or a long weekend to get your master's, uh, your MS. So <laughs> it's not a fucking problem there, partner. But, uh, <laughs> yep. Anyway, uh, Rio has great. I mean, I think also people like it because. If you, if you like full-bodied wine, oh, you're you're in heaven, you know. And if you like yeah. lighter wine, then get a bottle of Crianza, and mm-hmm. it's delicious. And you just you spent like twelve dollars, and you got a great one, you know. Yeah. And but then you're like, oh, I like the big rich. Like it's it's kind of like Chardonnay, where it's got something for everybody. But the like at least at least if you stick with Rioja, right, like. Rioja is great for a number of reasons, one of which being, I can tell any of my friends who don't know anything about wine, hey, get a bottle of Rioja, R-I-O-J-A, Rioja, you can say it. The J is pronounced like an H, you're good. And they go into yeah. a store be like, you have Rioja, and they point over there, and they go to pick out a bottle, whatever, however much they want to spend, and they're going to get, you can, like, if they, have, there's, if they have five Riojas, you just pick one, chances are, it's going to be pretty reliably good. Well, and and the, people don't have to worry about that. And it's, it's the kind, sorry, one thing. Um, no, no, yeah. Uh, an interview, another great radio interview. I think they were talking to somebody who was like a psalm, some prominent psalm, like like a steakhouse or something. Yeah. And he was like, I don't know if he's an MS or whatever, but he was like, yeah, no, Volnay is the most um, widely sold like Burgundy in steakhouses, or at least in our whole like whatever, because simply because like people can pronounce it easily. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. look at the menu and you don't have to yeah. like look like a fucking idiot trying to class de vow jet you know you don't have to yeah. worry about trying to say something like that you're like oh volnay boom yeah sold um so standing with rioja and so let, we should go into another fucking conversation about that but we should write down what conversations we should be having but it doesn't really matter we're not taking this seriously enough uh, we, well, As we, we should also not be vaguely know what they are because they come up it's true they will come up <laughs> um we'll talk about them but, but um yeah great with, values uh, and it's, yeah it's fantastic so and it's very literally what I was doing when I was in the shop. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I talked myself up in price, which I rarely will do with wine. Because in when you're talking about Rioja, mm-hmm. and this is this is a whole metric that you could probably, we could work out and like gradiate and show someone. Mm-hmm. If we cared enough. Which, yeah. Uh, well, but like an interesting way to look at wines, I think, would be the meaningful price jumps you make and how how profound they actually are in terms of the quality of the wine. And well, with Rioja... I mean, that's, that's, that's going to depend based on the person and their tastes. Well, it is, but like... But, but, so the example that I'm thinking of and the reason I bring it up is because Rioja, I can very clearly say when I was in the store, it was $5 intervals. Like I was looking at a $15 mm-hmm. wine, a $20 wine, and a $25 wine, and I talked myself up two levels to the $25 wine, bought it, and I'm having a great time. But I know I wouldn't have been disappointed with the $20 wine. And 
I really wanted to talk myself into buying both so I could compare them. But that, you know, is a bigger jump up. Whereas if you're talking about like, um, if you're talking about Burgundy and you're looking at a Village and a Premier Crew and a Grand Crew, then you're talking about, you know, best case scenario, if you're in a shop that actually has all three of those, yeah. you're talking about jumping from, you're talking about doubling in price, not a $5 jump. You're talking about like, oh, I'm, I might spend 50 bucks on a Village, mm-hmm. 80 to 100 on Premier Crew, and like 150 on a Grand Crew. And it won't be like Von Romney Grand Crew. It'll be right. like a lesser village, you know, lesser in the in the concatenation of whatever the right. hell that but means. But also, to you whoever, know, but. Pr- producer matters vastly. If you're going to do like a, mm-hmm. like a fucking. But you're looking at those kind of striations of price when you're talking about Burgundy. You're looking at Village being generally in the. Yeah, Coaster, you know, their, their, their Bourgogne can go for like four hundred dollars or something and the uh, yeah, regular yeah, yeah. merceau village level will cost like 800 like it's fucking yeah. insane so and that's totally a thing but you're still looking at these like it's all about like orders of magnitude of like whether you're looking at geometric expansions or exponential expansions or whatever the mm-hmm. correct term is or like just yeah, arithmetic yeah. additions and rio yeah, has yeah. great because you're looking at five dollar intervals that are differences in the quality of the wine that are meaningful and relate to how much you will enjoy it based on your taste mm-hmm and I can't, in good faith, tell someone, like, yeah, if you go and want to buy Pinot from Burgundy, you'll be happiest spending... Like, I don't know what to tell people with that, because it too much relates to their taste, and, like, you know, I don't know what the relationship between what they buy versus what... You know, that's mm-hmm. that's a big, whole, complicated thing, that, you know, Burgundy is amazing, and I want people to go drink it, but I don't know how to tell people about that. Whereas with Rioja, I can say, like, look... If you take a couple pot shots, drink a Crianza, drink a Grand Re- uh, Reserva, whatever, then you'll know where you stand on literally fi- like five to ten dollars difference in price. Which right. and, and then you're maxing out at like thirty five bucks in most wine shops. Mm-hmm. You'll probably have one that's like fifty bucks, and you know yeah. maybe one night you splurge by that one. Great, and that's that's a beautiful thing because that's how wine's supposed to be, right? Wine is supposed to be this mm-hmm. thing where you're not worrying about like. Your monthly mortgage as the difference in price between two echelons of quality. Mm-hmm. You're worried about an extra cost of a latte yeah. in the differences in quality. Mm-hmm. It's like if you're looking at, you know, different, and then and then that becomes complicated when you look at regions like. Uh, to pick one I can know something about off the top of my head, the Willamette Valley, where it's like, <laughs> if you want to just buy a Pinot Gris from the Willamette Valley, you have 17 options that are between 15 and $20, and I cannot tell you, based on their price, which ones are going to be best, right. because that is not that is not how those choice, that that is not how those definitions get made. There are too many other factors there. Whereas with Rioja, it's like, nope, the Crianza was aged this long, the Reserva was aged this long. The ground mm-hmm. reserva was aged at least this long. Basically, you know, five to ten dollar windows in price difference between those. Yeah, I can tell you that. Uh, but you know, if we're gonna swivel over to like New World Chardonnays, we're looking at stuff between fifteen and a hundred bucks. And yeah. hey, you know what? <laughs> you it does it doesn't matter how good you are at darts. Just throw the dart at the board. <laughs> <laughs> wherever it hits yeah. that's right it's whatever it's what you like and you will have to buy all of those wines to find out what that means because in in term again in terms of the valley stylistically that many different things are happening it's different when you talk about california versus you know white berg but then you're back into a conversation where it's like yeah the difference in echelons of like value have to do with the name of the producer much less something you can know about how the wine was made like empirically uh, and then, you know, you're still in conversations where the differences between echelons are, you know, 40 to $50 at a time. Mm-hmm. And that's, just, it's one of the things that beleaguers all of, you know, it, it just beleaguers people trying to get interested into, in wine and learn about wine because how do you know, most people, when they say they like red wine, you can, you know you can 
ask them about the red wines they're talking about, and then basically determine, all right, you should go to the store and buy a Rioja, or you should go to the store and buy a Barbera. And I know I'm not telling you to go spend more than 30 bucks, and I don't yeah. feel like a yeah. shitty person because yeah. exactly. I'm not telling you to spend more than 30 bucks. Mm -hmm. And those are both wines that, like, it's perfect because it means they're, like, it's just the right window. What you were saying earlier about someone coming in and being like, I have a budget of $6, and I normally yeah. drink this barefoot. Mm -hmm. And if you can just get them to spend that extra three bucks, you might be able to get them to a wine that will be better enough that it will teach them something about wine and yeah, set them no, totally. towards something cool. And yeah. if you if you just that's that's how you like and, and and the problem is getting people so invested that they're then suddenly like, I need to spend fifty dollars every time I buy a bottle of wine. It's like, no, 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 no. You can buy really cool wines for fifteen to twenty bucks. If you're if you're into Barberas and Riojas and all these varietals that come from these regions where they're making more wine than they know what to do with, like there are limitations. There are limitations on how many uh, kilograms per hectare you can grow in Rioja. Yeah, which is yeah cool. Like that's the inverse of how things are done with Pinot Noir and like you mm -hmm. know in a lot of places because they're just trying to get as much fruit as they can because exactly you know, the more fruit means the more wine that you can make mm -hmm. and admittedly thinning is a big part of like like uh, you know um uh Roman, the main Romani Conti is not you know they are crop thinning pretty aggressively mm -hmm. uh because they don't need to you know, they can make however little wine they make because each bottle is so expensive but I don't know it's this <laughs> it's this whole like Tempranillo is great because it's just this. It's. It's like wine looks to a lot of people like uh, one of those packages that is, um, that is plastic that has that you know that like weird edge where it's like a plastic package that you need a big hefty pair of scissors to cut into. Yeah. Oh, I hate those. I'd cut my fingers on those all the right? fuck time. Yeah. Kid. Yeah. That's how I think wine seems to a lot of people. Huh. That's a really. That's honestly great analogy. Well, and Tempranillo is, you know, buying the same product, but it was packaged in one of those, like, plastic sleeves with that one corner that you can rip up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And pull across. Like, that was designed so that you could actually get into the fucking thing. Mm -hmm. Tempranillo is like that little tab. Like, you can, yeah. you can grab it and pull it back, and suddenly you're into wine. Yeah. Whereas, like, just somebody who's really into wine being like, no, you, you want to learn about wine? You need to know about Chardonnays handing you a fucking, you know, pair of scissors that was packaged in a package that you need a really good pair of scissors to get into. Fuck. Yeah. Yep. <sighs> Man. I like Tempranillo. I like Tempranillo a lot. Rioja's great. <laughs> yeah, it's fucking delicious, dude. I yeah, love it. You know, at Costco, you can buy true Rioja. I think it's Crianza, but you can buy real Rioja for fucking seven dollars a bottle, and it's uh -huh. good. It is. Yeah, it that's is, crazy. It is. It's, it's not bad. It is like it is. It is good wine because it was made by people who care and are are good winemakers, and you know they just like fucking marketing is hard and complicated, and you know Costco has a lot of brand power, so they're like, no, no, we want to put Kirkland on that label, and some Spanish guy was like, okay, see. Yeah. <laughs> said yes in French as well for whatever reason <laughs> yep yeah dude no, I mean, uh, we, man we all delicious go buy it go buy Solid. it go get it Good. don't spend more than 25 bucks cause Unless, you don't have to oh, yeah if you don't have to but there are but if you decide you really do love it mm -hmm. there are some producers out there that make wines that are fucking like will blow your Bonkers. mind like oh yeah it's 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 the kind of thing where it's like try crianza oh this is good try a reserve oh this is good try a grand reserve you're like oh cool you know or even if you think it like well because certain i've had certain uh grand reservas that where i'm like i don't i don't like this yeah but i've had reservas where i'm like fuck this is so much better than their grand reserve mm -hmm. um so it's you know like it's it's hard to say you know if if you like something about it, try something of a different kind, like different producer. I mean, and then yeah. decide. Oh, okay, maybe I don't like that producer's Grand Reserve or something. Um, because yeah, there are some that some Grand Reserves that are so fucking good. 
and I actually oh, yeah. need to go. I need to um, like 2010 was an insane vintage in Rioja, like fucking mm-hmm. one of the greatest ever. It was and defined so, as excelente because that's something they <laughs> no, that's something they literally do in Rioja. Going back to 1925, yeah. every year has a qualification between. Um, uh, well, there's uh, I don't know exactly how they sack up, but it, so they go like there's mediana, normal, uh, buena, muy buena, and excelente. <laughs> in nice. terrible pronunciation, but it's, like that's pretty flawless. I'll be but, honest, but that's because of all the laws that surround Rioja and the nature of it. Like they can say that about the vintages. And, mm-hmm. and people can say vin- stuff about vintages everywhere, but like they have, like it's it's a codified thing. Like, yeah, they're rated by a regulating council that go back. Yep, these are. This is how good the vintage was. So yep. if you see a 2010, 2011, also excelente. Like, yep, both of them. But if you see like a, if you see a, actually a lot of the recent global global warming's being good for real. <laughs> but if you go yeah. back to. Uh, if you go back to um same thing as champagne yeah 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 the last uh and this might also have something to do with marketing but the last normal vintage was 1984 and since hmm. then they've all been buena muy buena or excelente so huh yeah. interesting yeah interesting yeah sorry i sidetracked you there but but like you were saying the sky is kind of always the limit in terms of what you want to what you can spend on wine if you like it like if you if you if you like california cabernet sauvignon and you have more money than uh you know brain cells good news for you buddy you can spend as much money as you want on that shit just as much money as you could possibly imagine you can spend on that yeah (laughs) you can do it it will happen yeah. There, there is always somebody willing to take your money for that shit. And in, you know, the nice thing about reliable, like it's one of the kind of great things about wines where the floor is so inexpensive because yeah. it means that the really good ones have a huge burden of proof. Mm-hmm. Suddenly the wine has to be really, really good. It's one of the things that's kind of tough about Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir, because the most expensive current release vintages of any wine anywhere are Pinot Noirs, it means all mm-hmm. Pinot Noir has to be like, you know, some insight into why that could happen. Right. And that's why people feel like they can charge $50 for their like mid echelon Pinot Noir from a, you know, region like, you know, some for New World Pinot Noirs feel justified mm-hmm. saying that, you know, yeah. their, their, their entry level will be half that. But then they're mm-hmm. like serious wine that isn't their like top tier thing is 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty standard. And then you want the good shit? Double that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Just double it. That's how that's how the pricing works. It's like you take the price, you double it, and that's the next echelon. Whereas in Tempranillo, it's like in Rioja, it's like start at 15 bucks. Next level, add $5. Next level, add $5. Yeah. And then you want like a better, pro- like a top tier producer, then you double that price. But you know, it's a smaller number you doubled. So yeah, uh, you know. But yeah, you there there are these beautiful expressions of very very delicate, very 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 inventive tempranillo out there that mm-hmm. yeah, more expensive. But again, it, like it, it's kind of a more worthwhile jump in price. Like, that jump in price relates to a different experience for you as a wine drinker than the jump in price between like you know a normal expensive premier crew uh burgundy and a high clout burgundy producer right mm-hmm. like, yeah 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 hey, you want to wrap up the uh rioja episode we can do something else Sounds good, man.